just very quickly, just to get said, so China announced a move to a two-child policy uh, late last year. So, you know, a lot of people have been saying, well, this is the end. This is the end of the one-child policy. And um, my argument is, one, it's not really the end because the one-child policy is just a name we use to describe a set of policies put in place starting 1980 to regulate fertility in China. And uh, a move from one to two uh, broadens some of the uh, parameters, but it's still a restriction. You can't have any number of children you want any time you want. So, but it is on its last legs. But the effects still continue. And I'll raise something very topical right now. In a matter of a few days, there's a big uh, occurrence in China that has a lot to do with what I'm talking about, demography. Um, anybody know what that occurrence is? I'll give you a hint. I'm wearing the colors of the Hongbao right now. What's that? What's that big occurrence? Anyone know? Chinese New Year. Chinese New Year, Chunjie, right? And we see that this is the biggest human migration at this time. You know, if you ever see any stories about China, you'll see all these massive numbers of people trying to take the train or the bus or whatever to get home. Uh, you know, and then you you may also have read some stories about how this is a time where families get together and also um, enormous expectations are based on these families. You may have read about, say, uh, some women who dread going home for Chinese New Year because their parents are asking, why aren't you married yet? And some women are hiring uh, fake boyfriends to bring home to sort of get their parents off their back. Now, these are all uh, in some way um, issues that deal with uh, the one-child policy and its, um, you know, its attempts to sort of um, stem the population uh, uh, tide and also to shape uh, the composition of China's people. Uh, so I would argue, and this is what the book says, that um, even though the one-child policy is on its last legs, I do believe it is ending soon, uh, some of these consequences set into effect will go on for quite a long time to come, certainly for one generation and beyond. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. So very quickly, what is the one-child policy? Um, it's the longest running social experiment, right? It's, it's been going on for 35 years now. It's still ongoing. And even though we call it a one-child policy, not everybody has just one child in China. And this is part of the misunderstanding. Um, it basically um, about, uh, let me just give a quick show of hands. How many of you have siblings in this? How many of you have siblings? How many of you have no siblings? Okay, if you were in China and you were in a room, there would be, you would be 90% uh, of the class in, in an urban setting because about 90% of all urban China have uh, one child, uh, are restricted to the one child. If we look bigger, broadly speaking, across all of China, roughly about a third uh, of China, so Chinese households, are restricted to one child very strictly. The rest of it, there are certain exceptions that are allowed for. So that, that's part of the misunderstanding. People say, oh, one child. What do you mean one child? You know, I know my friend from China has three children, so what are you talking about? Um, the answer is, um, in order to make such a policy work initially in the beginning, they realized that not everybody's going to follow it, so certain exceptions were made to the rule. So you could have more than one child, uh, depending on when, where you lived. Uh, if you were uh, in a rural area, you might be able to have a second child if your first one is a girl. This is an acknowledgment that uh, Chinese people value sons. Uh, if you were one of China's ethnic tribes, let's say if you're Tibetan or, or Uyghur, you would probably be allowed to have more than one child because minorities were exempt. Also, you might be able to have one child if you worked in a dangerous profession, like if you were a coal miner <coughs> or a fisherman. Um, so these were part of the reason. So in the end, for, you know, people said, really, it's a 1.5 child situation. But nobody uses that because it's such a clunky sounding name. And now, of course, it's a two child. And everybody's hit. It's hard to get around it. So all these exception, uh, exemptions uh, make it hard for people to understand. Oh, and one more reason you can have more than one child. If you pay, here's the thing, right? Um, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, if you were willing to pay the fine. And again, how much the fine was also varied. And this is another reason why you cannot uh, understand it. Because in many cases, um, uh, it was a multiple of your family household income, somewhere between two to ten times. And ob obviously, two times is, is very different from ten times. Uh, and some of it is dependent on the discretion of the family planning uh, official in question. So all these kind of very somewhat arbitrary and hard to understand rules made it hard for people in China to understand the one-child policy, not even you know, people outside China. The analogy I use for Western audiences is basically, 
it's like trying to tell people about the tax code. It's, it's just you know, too difficult and complex. Um, and I'll show you this um, uh, um, cartoon that was uh, somewhat popular. And it sort of tries to show the arbitrariness of, of it. And um, the uh, guy on the chopping block is uh, supposedly a, a man who has uh, broken the one-child policy and had, has to pay a fine. The woman with the meat cleaver is a, a family planning commission and com official, and she's saying, you are now the meat on my chopping block. I can do whatever I want with you. A fine of 860,000 renminbi. And this was actually based on a real story of uh, a man who was told that he had to pay a big fine in Wenzhou uh, in China. And, um, and he told the family planning official he couldn't afford it. And she said, OK, this is how much it's going to be tomorrow. It's going to be this much more. And so it became a very popular internet meme. And, and that's what it was. So let's talk about some of these side effects, which is what the book is all about. And, and some of you probably know some of this, so I don't want to go into it in too, deta uh, too much detail. But um, what has it done is it's basically changed the composition, not just the size uh, of, of the Chinese population, but also the composition. So in three, well, in th I basically sum it up by saying two, two male, two old, and two few. This is the problem with China going ahead. Two male, why? Because when you tell a, a country that uh, values sons over daughters, you have to choose. You can't have both. Then many families did choose to have only sons, or primarily only sons. Um, and so the end result is now China has 30 million more men than women. Uh, they call them guanggong, uh, broken branches, right? Uh, bare branches, which is, uh, suggests you know, this is the end of the biological line for them. What is 30 million? 30 million is about the size of Canada. So if you know, China wants to fulfill uh, the needs of these bachelors, it's going to have to import uh, a population the size of Canada, all women of marriageable age, uh, to China. Uh, very unlikely to happen. Too old, what does this mean? Um, China has a huge cohort of people who are aging. That has nothing to do with the one-child policy. It's a simple function of we are all living longer, um, and, and that happens everywhere. So the average age expectancy in China in the 1950s was 49 years old. Now it's pretty much where it is everywhere else in the world, 80 years old, thereabouts. Um, and the big cohort of people that were born in the 60s and 70s are, that went into the factories in the 90s to work and helped China become this massive manufacturing juggernaut that makes all your iPhones and all your laptops and uh, quite large components of your cars and cameras and everything you think of, uh, those people are going to get older. So by 2050, one in four Chinese people will be a retiree. Uh, if you counted all the senior citizens of China at that point, they would be able to form the world's third largest nation. Uh, you would have China, India and senior China as the world's three largest nations. So, um, so this is nothing new with the one-child policy. The problem with it is, obviously, where is the young working age population you're going to have to support this big group? And that has everything to do with the one-child policy. Currently, China's, uh, ha China has an economic ratio of about five working adults to one retiree. That's a very good, very healthy economic ratio. Uh, in about 20 years, it's going to jump to one and a half adults to one retiree. So that is obviously not such a good thing. So if we look at the uh, population pyramid, this is 1953. This is kind of what people imagine the population pyramid would be. All the, 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 the bulk is at the bottom when people are born. And then over time, more people die. And then you know, at the top, where you see age 85, it's a much smaller group. This was in 64. This was in 82. We started to see what we call the demographic dividend, that big bulge of people growing older, entering the workforce. This is very good for China at the time, 2000. Now you still see it's no longer a, a, a pyramid. It's more like a, a battleship maybe, right? Um, and then now it's 2010. Now we see 2020. And you can see that group is you know, down to the 60s and so on. And then now 2030. And you can see the bottom here is shrunken a little bit. And and at this point, at some point, it's going to look more like a diamond, you know? And that's the shape and composition going ahead. Now, this is um, aging societies. Uh, we don't know exactly what the implications are because the world is just starting to enter this phase. 
But um, we look at Japan as an example. That, that's one of the, it's older thing. And Japan's economy has been stagnant for the last 10 years. Some of it has to do with uh, its policies, but some of it also has to do with its demo uh, demographic <coughs> composition. It's an elderly population. Um, uh, what we're used to thinking of China as, you know, world's largest consumer market of cell phones, cars, and so on, is going to change in the future because older people don't buy the latest cell phones. They don't want the latest computers. They're saving. Um, they're worried about their health. You know, so the, the kind of uh, uh, dynamic economy that we're used to thinking of is is going to change, and, and quite quickly, relatively speaking, because the rest of the world, ha um, uh, Europe, for example, has transitioned also to an aging society. We are all having living longer. We are all, for the most part, having smaller families, with certain exceptions in the world, of course. And so, but everywhere else in the world that has made that transition has taken 50 years to do it. China is going to do this in 25 years. So that's a lot shorter time to do all the preparations you need. Where are you going to build all your hospices, your nursing homes, build up your pension plans, Medicare, Medicaid, whatever. It's all going to have to be done much quicker. Um, so um, I'm going to jump to this part. So this is basically the framework that we know about the one-child policy is in effects. Now the question here is, how do I tell the story? Because um, this is a story. I wanted to tell a story. I didn't want to write a collection of facts and figures that you could read in a UN report or in a short um, you know, magazine article. How do I keep you uh, interested you know, for the course of a whole book? So my answer was, and I've been in the business of telling stories for a long time, is to, is to tell stories on this, to tell stories about people, people stories. Um, and I'm, so what I'm going to do is, um, and because obviously we have a bit of short time, and I certainly want to leave a lot of time for questions, is to give you a sort of a snapshot of some of the stories of the people who have been affected by the one-child policy that I tell. And um, I'll start first with this one. Hold on. <laughs> the earthquake in Sichuan had far-reaching implications across China. Large numbers of Sichuanese have spread across the country to work on construction sites and in factories as migrant laborers. This group is making the 800-mile return trek under the worst circumstances. They have no information about their loved ones. This is Liu Jishu. He and his wife, Tang Shuxiu, are migrant construction workers. They were working on luxury villas in Beijing when the earthquake struck. Their first thought was for their 15-year-old daughter, Hui Mei, whom they had left behind when they searched for jobs last year. Hui Mei lives in Muyi, near the quake's epicenter. Since disaster struck, they haven't heard anything from their daughter. Getting home for the migrant workers was anything but easy. Most don't have the 300 or so US dollars for a flight, so they ride the rails. An uncomfortable 30-hour train ride southwest where you can sit or stand, but sleeping is hard to do, and at the end, the train only gets you partway there. Besides destroying homes and possessions and taking tens of thousands of lives, the quake also wiped out roads and rails, so the travelers were forced to go by boat, and later, by foot, they carried medicine, clothing, fruit, instant noodles, and other scarce items with them into the disaster zone. The travelers were anxious and had scant information on their loved ones. Tension sometimes ran understandably high. <laughs> Liu Jishu and his wife felt more and more anxious as they neared Mu Yi. Approaching the hill where their daughter's school was before the quake, Xu Xiu was almost inconsolable. And then, <laughs> their worst fears were realized. Hui Mei had died in the earthquake. <laughs> Her name was on the list of those who had perished. <laughs> What has a natural disaster in Sichuan got to do with the one-child policy? You might ask that. 
So um, this story happened in 2008. Um, you know, Beijing was all geared up for the Olympics when uh, a couple of months before that they had an 8.0 earthquake in Sichuan. Over 70,000 people were killed. Now, what does what this to do with the one-child policy? I mean, sure, it's very unfortunate, but, you know, what's the relevance? My answer is, when I went with this uh, couple and they discovered that their daughter had been killed, I discovered also later on that this area of Sichuan near the epicenter was actually a test pilot program for the one-child policy before they launched it nationwide. Um, Beijing wasn't completely sure they could make this work, so what they did was they experimented in certain areas. So this area was one of the experimental areas, and they brought it worked so well, and they brought down the population so sharply that they were confident enough that they could take this nationwide, which they did in 1980. So consequently, 30 years down the line, it's a, almost a painful irony that many of these families not only lost children in the earthquake, they lost their only child. In some villages, as much as 70% of all families lost their only child. There, there were villages that basically lost a, a single generation because of the earthquake. Um, and so one of the strangest things I found was that uh, in a matter of weeks after the earthquake, um, so I'll, I'll show you. This, this man, his name is Du Jianming, he is a phosphate miner. And his teenage daughter was killed in the earthquake. Three weeks later, he went and had an operation to reverse vasectomy that he had to have had many years ago. This is part of the one-child policy. After you have your quarter of children, um, you have to go and get sterilized. So, um, so many of these parents were desperate. And I went to see him and his wife. The operation was technically a success. But he was 50 and his wife is 45 at that time. They felt very much that the sands of time were against them. I mean, you know, three weeks after the death of your child doesn't mean he wasn't mourning her. He really was, but he was desperate. And um, I went to see them in their village. And he, they, one of the things they told me was they said, look, um, we are being uh, avoided by our neighbors. They are, ignore, uh, they are avoiding us because they know that we don't have any children now and they're worried that we will probably hang on to them and cling on and borrow things from them all the time. And so they felt like they had lost an amount of social status. So um, the, the, the word now, there's a word now to describe uh, people who've lost their only child, shudu. Um, and um, there are about 76,000 of them in China, about a million of them every year. Some of them were USC parents, because if you recall, a couple of years ago, there were a couple of USC students killed in a carjacking, students from China. Uh, those, they were only children too. So that's Shudu parents for you. And um, the plight of a Shudu parent in China can be very hard. Some, for many of them, a child represents also financial security, obviously emotional investment, you love your child, but also, um, Society as a whole is not geared to recognize childless parents. Uh, in China, even though the family structure has been changed so much, it's still a very traditional structure. One man, one woman, one child. Um, you are not considered an adult until you get married, which is one reason why if you're not married during Chinese New Year, you won't get a home bow, right? Uh, you're not. <laughs> uh, sorry, you will get a home bow. You are, you're not eligible to give home bows until you're married. Th and this is a idea. So uh, you can be a woman in your 40s and still get a home bow, which is kind of a form of humiliation, um, social humiliation. So, um, and so when you lose your child, uh, for many, especially in the countryside, there's a loss of status involved as well. And there's also a fear of vulnerability. And also, um, it's also difficult to get admitted into nursing homes if you don't have a child. A lot of nursing homes will not accept you. They say, Where, who's going to authorize payments for your treatments? Uh, who's going to do this? Same reason for buying burial plots. You know, who's going to service this plot, the cost down the line? Who's going to pay for maintenance? because you have no children, you have no progeny. This is it, end of the line for you. So this was one story. And um, after I wrote the story, I had a sort of a very interesting side effect. Um, a woman, uh, I got an email from a woman in America. Uh, she was a doctor and she had had IVF treatment. Uh, she had several fertilized embryos. And she wrote to me and she said, they're in storage. Now she was very touched by the story. And she said, I don't know how this family would be like if they raised a small white child in a Chinese village, but I am so touched by the story, I want to give them my embryos, my fertilized embryos. 
Now, there were many reasons why this would not have worked, but it was possibly the strangest, most <laughs> generous gesture from a story that I ever received. So that's one story. Um, and I'm going to skip forward to some of them because um, I, I um, I want to go to this one because I think particularly for USC is very interesting. So um, the little emperor phenomena um, is, is one that's been discussed, right? One, one of the so-called side effects of the one-child policy is, is, is created this whole generation out of which a, a majority percentage are single children. What does this mean? There's a lot of speculation about it. There's been a lot of uh, social studies done on it. Um, uh, there have been some studies that said no difference. There have been some studies that say yes, difference. Uh, single children in China are smarter or do better or socially more well adjusted. And, and then, um, but a lot of the studies that I, I looked at um, were based on behavioral surveys comparing um, single children with children with siblings. Um, there was a, but starting I think about 2014, there was an interesting study done by a group of Australian economists where instead of looking at children, comparing children with uh, no, no siblings to children with siblings, they compared cohorts. One cohort born after 1980, one cohort born slightly before um, 1980. So the little emperor generation and the non little emperor. And they did a variety of, of tests, you know, um, games to test uh, whether or not people were willing to take a risk on gambling uh, and all this. And their conclusions and finds where there was a very marked difference between the children born after 1980. Uh, they tended to be more risk averse. They tended to be uh, less generous. Uh, they tended to be less optimistic. It was not very... Um, uh, it was not very uh, nice, you know, I, I talked to the researcher and she said, I felt kind of bad portraying the, the little emperor generation as this group of neurotic, <laughs> and you know, you, there are many of you guys who are here are part of that generation, right? I'm sure you have severe objections to it. So my questions were, what is, how do I tell the story? Do, you know, when I want to look at individual people, obviously individual people do not represent traits of the whole nation, right? What, but obviously, at the same time, certain people have very fascinating stories that, that do have something to say about the generation they are born in. So this person, uh, Genova, Gen any of you know him? Uh, he's actually pretty famous. And he's also a USC graduate. He's one of USC's, uh, the film school's most famous graduates. Um, he is a game designer, and he designs, uh, his games are considered to be very innovative because they, uh, they're not the kind of usual shoot 'em up kind of games, but they do. Um, they play on human emotions. They're sort of like mini movies. Uh, they have been um, shown. He's actually in the Smithsonian. He's considered one of M MIT. Uh, named him one of the 35 most innovative people in the world under the age of 35. Uh, at that time, uh, he uh, so, and uh, he uh, was born in Shanghai in 1981. So right after the one-child policy, he's the first generation. Um, and he had um, what he described as a sort of a very bruising uh, childhood in a sense. He says at one point he remembers being brought up by his grandparents. They were very loving. And then at some point he went back to his uh, parents and they, were, they had huge expectations. And this is the thing about the one child generation. Most parents were um, in, um, brought up and, and experienced things like the Cultural Revolution. They missed opportunities. When they had one child, they wanted to focus their laser-like focus and give them all the things and see them achieve all the things that they missed out on. I see a lot of nodding heads here. I bet you know what you're talking about. Um, and so he said, you know, he remembers as a child, his father uh, went to Beida. And so he remembers as a child, because he lived in Shanghai, his father took him up to Beijing. He says, I only saw two things. Uh, Beige, Beijing University, Peking University, and Tsinghua. I didn't see the Great Wall, I didn't see the Forbidden City, I didn't see anything but those two universities because that's where my father wanted me to go, one of them, the only one, that's the only one to consider. And then um, he went to a top school in um, Shanghai. Um, he said not only was it a top school, but it was the school for gifted children. And um, every uh, semester, they would, the kids with the lowest scores would get kicked back to the normal classes. They would be considered losers. So he, it was sort of like Hunger Games, you know, scholastically speaking. So he said um, he, he was always, you know, he made no friends. He was always calculating how close was he to the edge and when he would fall off. And um, when he was 14 years old, his parents, 
splurged and bought him a personal computer. Now, this is early 90s for China. You know, that's equivalent of someone buying a, a Stradivarius for their kid to practice violin lessons on. You know, it, it's, it's, they wanted him to be, a, a, you know, a computer programmer, maybe work for IBM, do some things. Instead, um, he wanted, he, but he, all he wanted to do was play computer games. <laughs> And this is one of the computer games he designed um, when he was here at USC. Um, all his games are about escape, about flying, about um, what it's like to um, share things. It's, it's not about killing or shooting or maiming or zombies. So um, they're all very, um, so, so he's actually quite successful. He has a three game deal with Sony that, and some of his games are considered the most popular ones on Sony Playbox. Uh, I don't play games, so I don't know. Was it play PlayStation? Yeah, PlayStation. Yes, yes, yes. PlayStation. So, um, so this is, you know, obviously as an example of the little uh, um, of the little emperor generation. Are they not creative? Not true. He's one of the most innovative uh, young men under 35, according to MIT. Um, are they pressured? In his case, he certainly is. I mean, is he successful? He's moved here. He's living here. He's just married, um, and he he tells me he said, you know, I'm. My wife and I, you know, we can have any children we want. We live in America now. But here's the thing. I feel like I can't have more than one because I have to take care of my parents. You know, his mother just recently had surgery. Um, it didn't go well in, in, in Shanghai. He brought her over here to do it. It took half his savings, you know. And he, so it's this kind of a thing that makes, uh, I think, the little emperor generation unique. Because there is this sense, you know, they call it the 421 phenomena, right? Um, you have, you know, at one point, you were the adored child uh, with your grandparents and your parents loving you and taking care of you and focusing on you. But now that you're, you know, the oldest of you are about 30s, your parents in your 50s. And um, the, the attention has to go back sixfold. So it's enormous burden for many young Chinese today. And this is translated into all sorts of ways on a regular basis. Um, for example, uh, the biggest one would be the marriage squeeze, right? Um, if you have a single child, and especially if it's a boy, you are very, very invested in his, who, who he marries. So it's never a question of just a guy and a girl, or a guy and a guy, or a girl and a girl dating. Uh, but also the parents' involvement. So, uh, for example, major companies like GE, like uh, Baidu, um, actually have what they have call um, singles clubs, called Tanshin Jilabu, where they organize mixers for their workers, typically mostly male, to socialize and meet nice girls with the aim of getting married and getting settled down. Now, part of it is considered a, a kind of asset in order to sort of lure and keep good talent. Uh, but, um, you know, by doing all these guys actually send newsletters out, newsletters to the parents of these kids saying, oh, these are the kind of things we do. And the parents come and say, please, we like these mixer things. Keep having them. Keep having them some more. Can you imagine if Google or Apple did that here? You know, it's, it's, it's a very different culture and a different concept. Also, um, some companies will specifically advertise in their classified want ads that they do not, they prefer to hire hires of uh, people who are not children, uh, ch they say we prefer to hire people who have siblings. Uh, why? We don't want to hire only children. Uh, the argument is for some of these companies is um, they make bad hires because uh, say my, my job, uh, I require my employees to travel a lot and usually for single children their parents will object and then they leave the job very quickly. They can't hack it, you know, things like that. So even though some of these are perceptions of a generation that clearly don't apply to everyone, uh, they clearly do shape things like hiring uh, decisions, marriage decisions, all sorts of things. So it's not just a question of abortions and sterilizations when we think of the one-child policy, but simple things like dating and, and, and jobs. Oh, okay. Um, and um, let's see. Hold on one second. Uh, the other story um, I wanted to tell about this also, in that, well, actually, I'll skip that one because um, there are lots of stories. I'll, I'll tell this one then. Uh, so this was a story that I wanted to use to illustrate the whole gender imbalance issue. In 2009, I was flipping through some newspapers, and I saw a story about some runaway brides from central China. I was like, what is this runaway brides? You know, I was thinking in cinematic terms and I envision, you know, a group of women sprinting across the paddy fields, their wedding veils rippling in the wind, you know. But really what it was, was I went down to this village. So, and what happened is, of course, 
we're talking about female shortage, right? In this village in central China, this man, his name is Zhou Bin, uh, he was about 25 at that time. Now, for, um, for rural China, that's a huge disgrace not to be married. His parents were very worried about him. He worked in the factories every year, Chinese New Year, he would go home. And of course, his parents say, uh, have you got anyone? Where's, where's your girlfriend? You know, and, and this built up to the point where they were so worried that they arranged a match for him with someone they didn't know because the village, the problem with the village had about 30 marriageable bachelors and no marriageable, no marriageable women on their books. This was a consequence of everybody having sons and then the girls all left and they didn't come back because they could work in the factories. They didn't want to come back and live on a farm where life is hard. So, um, so the, one of the consequences of that from a simple economics point of view was um, bride prices rose. Um, I, I had been working in China for some time, but I did not know about bride prices, which is a kind of a reverse dowry. It's what the groom's <coughs> family gives to the bride's family. It's typically a custom of the countryside, not so much in the cities. And so because of the shortage of women starting in the 1990s, bride prices were rising. People used to just give clothes or, you know, flower, uh, I mean, uh, furniture maybe. But now it was worth something like, by the time he got married, 10 years worth of farming income. So any family that had a son would have to borrow uh, quite a bit of money to, to, for a bride price. In his case, um, he, so when I went to his house, um, his mother was there and she showed me we had a good chat. It's one of those traditional Chinese houses with a big courtyard in the middle so people sit around. And right in the middle of the courtyard was a motorcycle. It was a, a red color motorcycle with red ribbons tied around the handles. This was a, a price, price that they had bought for the bride because they knew that um, village life was difficult. They sort of wanted her to have a, a, a nicer time that she could get out of the village. Um, but now, of course, she had run away, so the motorcycle was just sitting there. And, um, and so he met and married her, and, um, and very soon after that, um, other um, uh, of the neighbors had asked, oh, do you have, does she have a friend that she can introduce for my son? And she, you know, and she did, and they were all three women married, and next thing you know, they all disappeared. <laughs> and um, at the time, I was kind of thinking, yeah, <laughs> good for these women, because you know, um, the life in the countryside for a woman can be very bleak. China is one of the few places in the world, the only place in the world for a long time, where more women traditionally killed themselves than men. Most other parts of the world, it's more men that kill themselves than women. In China, it was women, and more particularly, rural women, because life in the farm can be very hard. Imagine, um, most of the farm work is still done by hand. There are no heavy machinery, um, very little running water. Um, you're expected to get married and have children. If you don't have sons, you could have problems. You could be taken away for a forced abortion, sterilized. Um, uh, in this village that I went to, there was only one small little sort of shop, and most of the things that sold were things like uh, pesticide and you know farm implements so, and pesticide is the chief uh, drug of choice for killing yourself um, I think uh, Elizabeth Rosenthal called this like a Valium in the, in the bathroom cabinet for Chinese people so um, but right now guess what the suicide rate for women have gone down in China and part of it's because there are fewer women in rural areas they've all gone and worked in the factories and they don't come back a lot of them because they don't have any inheritance rights but the men are still tied to the village, um, at least um, uh, with the, the household resi registration. And so the suicide rates are actually rising for men and elderly people in China. So this is one of the consequences of a sort of a lopsided, imbalanced population. Um, so, and then the final story I'm going to tell you, and then we'll open it to questions, is I have a lot of these stories, of fascinating stories of, of different people suffering or having different aspects of the policy applied to their lives. But one of my, diff I was trying to explain all this to a, a Westerner and he said, well, the problem with your, your, your book is going to be you have um, no one central character, no one is always there true, and also Western people can't keep all these Chinese people straight. Their names are too difficult to memorize. It's going to be so difficult. You need a central character. Um, you need a spirit guide who's going to be there and hold their hand and take them to this strange country. So then my decision was, who's going to be that spirit guide? What do I get? And that was when I decided to write myself into the story. Um, and, you know, this was kind of difficult for me to do because my whole training as a journalist was to not be part of the story. I was always supposed to be a... Um, a sort of a dispassionate observer. 
This is what happened. That's it. How many weeks do you think it is? Oh, did you see that arms moving? Did you see the arms moving? Oh my goodness. Look at that. So um, when I was covering the earthquake in Sichuan, I later on discovered that I was pregnant. Um, uh, and this was a very strange time to, to be thinking about having a family or having a child when clearly I was writing about a lot of people who had lost their only child. And so I, I was very torn between my, my feelings of you know, personal joy and at the same time um, you know, a huge amount of sadness. Um, later on, I, I had a miscarriage. Uh, and that didn't happen. And again, I saw I had a sort of a taste of what it's like, obviously not the same thing, but of what it means to lose a child or lose the hope of a child. And then later on, I tried to do IVF in China. And then I discovered the other thing that, that, that uh, the one-child policy has had some effect on. When you have technology, what do people do with technology when it goes against government policy? So I discovered people were uh, mainly, say, trying to use some of it. Some people were using it to try and have multiples. Uh, so twins or triplets are counted as a single birth uh, in China. So you don't have to pay a fine, you maybe don't lose your job. So there were people who were trying to do that. In one particular case, there was a woman who had, uh, let me look at this, hold on a second. She had <laughs> eight <laughs> children with the use of surrogate uh, mothers uh, and herself as well. And um, now, of course, then this has gone on to affect China's, uh, not just America, but China as well. And this, I'm sorry, not just China, but America as well. This man, Tony Jiang, these are his two children. They were all born by an American surrogate mother living in the Bay Area. So they're all American babies. So what we used to see as a sort of a, a, a reverse flow of babies, because for a long time, and this is an issue, I didn't bring up the adoption issue, right? People were going to China to get babies. Now, Chinese people, some of them are coming here to get babies um, because a lot of third party reproductive technologies are uh, banned or, or, or sort of uh, um, highly regulated in China. Uh, most of these kind of things like IVF and all are only available to married couples in China. Uh, if you are, say, a single woman in China and you want to do something like freeze your eggs uh, to preserve your fertility down the run, it's very hard to do that. Most of them come here. If you want a surrogate mother, let's say if you have difficulties carrying a child to full term, uh, surrogacy is technically illegal in China and um, there were some cases of surrogate mothers who were pregnant who were taken away for a forced abortion. So these are all issues that come into play. So as a result, we sort of see a, a reverse baby flow. And, and a lot of it's happening exactly here in California. Um, and we, you've seen some of the stories about the maternity hospitals and the clampdowns upon them. And uh, Jeb Bush you know, was famous for recently saying something about um, Asian anchor babies. Uh, these are all issues that play on today and have impact on us as well. I'll be happy to discuss all this and more. Uh, later, but I think we're out of time. So I'm going to open the floor now to questions. Yes, I want to uh, see a, a theme that you mentioned earlier was on pension. The extension of your uh, of the one child policy would be maybe leading to this third thing. You didn't go further with that. I want to see what you for in your book. But going from the traditional uh, mobile uh, children uh, supporting uh, parents and grandchildren to one child and high expectations. And now initiating, really starting, uh, which we're, we're so behind in this country, fully funding. How is it in China now as far as the pension system? In the city? Oh, okay, so the pension system in China um, is evolving. It is. I mean, I have to say, the Chinese government is rolling up a lot of these things very quickly. They ha well, have a yibao system in place, which is like their Medicare and Medicaid. Um, they, uh, the pension systems, um, I think, are, are also evolving to some degree. But the arguments and complaints I hear in many cases, it, it's not enough. And certainly, if you look at the numbers, it's way too high. So, um, you know, if you have a population, and certainly from a public health perspective, I mean, China suddenly has 25% of the world's Parkinson's disease sufferers. In a matter of 20 years, it's going to jump to 60%, simply as a percentage of the elderly. So uh, you can imagine all these multipliers for Alzheimer's, for dementia, all these things that you have. So the calls on the public purse for all this are going to be huge. So the question is, how is China going to spend the money? Is it going to spend it on, to service an aging population? 
uh, because the, those demands will be huge. Is it going to spend it on a basket of policies to indu uh, 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 encourage childbirth, such as um, you know, uh, uh, ch uh, free schooling, uh, health, uh, health care, child care, maternity benefits, parental benefits? And there, these are all huge amounts of money. The countries that have spent this kind of money are countries that are much further along economically. I know we say China is the world's second largest economy now, but as a, percent as a, as a percentage, it's still fairly small. I mean, as a, as, as a living condition, of the average person. I mean, China, I think, has um, about, f his economy is about a fourth the size of, um, of Korea. I, I, no, don't hold me to that right now because I have to look at those numbers. But the idea is, even though it's the large, second largest in the world, as a whole, the basket, the composition for, for people individually, it's still very little. Per capita GDP is something like a sixth. Yeah, it's a six of the United States, a fourth of South Korea. You know, so you know th there was always the saying, right? China's going to get old before it gets rich. Uh, everybody says it now, and in a matter of speaking, it's true. Um, next question, sorry. Yeah. yeah uh, well, thank you so much for uh, speaking here. Um, um, my question is that um, would you see that a Chinese government will support a nationwide migration, international global migration, to solve some of the problems we're facing right now? For example allow uh, women from uh, some Asian countries to uh, migrate to China, or allow some elderly uh, Chinese population to migrate to countries such as New Zealand, Australia, or uh, Canada, or some degree we're seeing already, but it, it happens in a very organic way. If you have money, you choose to get a green card in Canada. Hmm. The next day, you migrate to LA, Orange County. But do you, do you, do you think that uh, in the future, uh, would that be something that the Chinese government want to endorse? Well, they certainly, you know, certainly they're facing a population shortage. They won't be endorsing an outward flow of their most uh, talented, smartest uh, people, right? The answer is, if they, are they trying to get a reverse in to, to, to supplement and grow the population? Now, historically speaking, uh, China has always been a very monocultural Place. You know, it has not always, it has not encouraged immigration. It's not like America where it's sort of, sort of, even though, of course, uh, there, there are caveats on that front. But um, the, China recently announced um, a sort of a program to encourage overseas Chinese uh, to come back. Now, it's not sure how that's going to happen, but the numbers alone are going to be too small uh, to fill anything like the need they have. You know, you know um, so it's. I don't know how they're going to do it, but historically speaking, they haven't done it in the past. If anybody who's tried to get the so-called red card in China, you know, um, I'd say it's a million times much harder than getting a green card in America. You know, permanent residency in China, it's it's, it's much much harder, and so um, it's it's been more like Japan. It doesn't has not historically welcomed immigration, um, and of course, you know, immigration brings its own set of problems to how do you manage a sort of an alien population in a country, and then also it's also the size issue, right? The mix, right? Uh, let's say they encourage a lot of overseas uh, Chinese to come back. Well, these overseas Chinese will probably be, on the whole, pretty well off. They're not going to marry the farmers who are the desperate ones in needs of, of, of uh, brides. So, um, you know, it's going to be very, very complex. I don't know that they can find those huge numbers or if they have the will and the desire to do that. Other places that have tried doing it, like Singapore, for example, which is much smaller, um, have found they have all sorts of attendant difficulties. The local population is resentful of immigrants uh, who they feel steal opportunities from them, and they had all these resulting changes and desire. So it, it will be a very problematic solution, assuming um, it's done. Yeah. Okay, so the left behind children that you're talking, just for some people who may not know, um, it's a phenomenon of urbanization. So, you know, as we said, uh, life on the farm is hard. And so all the jobs are in the city. So there's a huge migration of young people to the cities. But the problem is because of their household residency status, they cannot raise their children in the cities. They still have a rural residency status. With, and you cannot, if you cannot change that, that means your children have no rights to go to the school in the city. They can't be educated. So you leave them in the countryside. You leave them in the farm with your grandparents, usually. And that's why they're called left behind children. Now, I have an interesting story about one of these left behind children. Mm, let's see where we are. Okay, let's go here. This particular story is of a man 
uh, Yang Li Bing and his uh, girlfriend, and this is the child that they had. So um, he and she had met working in factories, um, and she got pregnant, but they couldn't get married because the legal age for marriage for women in China is 20. She was underage then. So they went back to his village for her to have the child, and after they had the child, uh, then, of course, they had to go out to work again in the city. Uh, she was not registered because they were not married. They couldn't get a, a birth permit without any. So she was vulnerable, and what happened was the family planning officials confiscated her. They made his parents sign the rights over for her. She ended up in an orphanage, and she is now believed to be adopted and living in America. They've never seen her. This was the first and only picture that they ever had of his daughter. I met Yang Li Bing in Changsha. And this was a part of a bigger, wider story about how uh, family planning officials in a certain part of China were seizing children and selling them into orphanages. And this is partly a, a bigger story, obviously, about the fact that when you put a shortage on something, uh, whether it be women or babies, a certain black market results. And so in this case, um, you know, I, I didn't talk about it much, but I do talk about it in a book. There was a huge, China became a huge supplier on the global adoption market. It's still the biggest supplier in the world today. Over 120,000 children were adopted from China, uh, most of them girls. Yes. And, um, but at some point, supply dried up, in part because the one-child policy, in part because of technology that enabled people to scan for the gender of the child they would have. And if they knew it was going to be a girl, instead of carrying it to full term, they would have an abortion. And so um, at some point, the supply dried up. But at the same time, the whole machinery had been set up. You know, the, they had been set up. Orphanages were used to receiving $3,000 per adoption per child. There was still obviously a huge global appetite or demand for healthy adoptable infants, no strings attached. And so these kind of things happened and left behind children were particularly vulnerable, obviously, because their parents are not around. I, I talked to one man, and he said um, his daughter, he said uh, he, they left his children behind with his mother, and he had, his mother was taking the daughter along to the clinic, and she, she met an a, a official on the way, says, you are too old to have this child, and they took her to the um, police station, and they made her do airplane arms, which is, you know, you stand there with your arms for hours and hours until they get really tired, until she agreed to sign over the rights for the child. He's never seen her since then. Um, uh, how widespread is it? I do not know, because it's hard. You know, these are not numbers that are clearly, um, um, in, most of the Chinese government has maintained that these cases are isolated, um, just, you know, a couple of bad hats, but there have been, in, you know, too many separate isolated incidents for them to be uh, you know, to be uh, just just that. There, there's more to it. And clearly the system has no transparency. There is huge demand, not enough supply. There's an exchange of money. It's very easy to see why corruption would enter into that system. Yeah, so. Uh, yes? I have two questions. Just on, on picking up what you said. You said enforce vasectomies for men? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, not most, yeah, enforced vasectomies for men. Yeah, is, you said you yeah, had a second question yeah. as well? Yeah, but, but that's definitely true, so I can quote. That. Yes, yeah. um, um, most parts of China, uh, it was more uh, women than men who had um, sterilizations. Even though, technically speaking, um, it's much easier to do the man than the woman, as I've sort of been told. Uh, but, you know, because of the sexism issues, they usually made the woman do it. I remember talking to a village head, and he was very, he was like, I have to show an example. And so I was the first in the village to get a sterilization. And then later on, when I questioned it, it turned out he meant his wife was the first to get it, not him. <laughs> but in Sichuan, where I talked about, this was an area where I heard a lot of demographers saying, you know, this is a very rare area because it's one of the areas where more men get sterilized than women. Uh, why is that so? And I found the reason for that was because there was a, a doctor there who pioneered a, message, uh, a, a method. It was called the no scalpel vasectomy. It's still used in a lot of third world countries today. It's considered very non-intrusive. Now, I talked to an anthropologist who had seen it done, and he described it to me. He said, you take something that looks like a crochet hook, and you insert it into the scrotal sac, and you wriggle it about, and in about five minutes, the operation is done. And they used they used to do it in a, a sort of an exhibition and displays in public areas to show you that, look, it's quite easy. You should come and get it done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's your answer about... Well, my question was, was it, is it enforced by law? Well, some of it is and some of it isn't. Look, yeah. Look, yeah. At the, yeah, look at the numbers. Look at the numbers, right? Um, as late as 2010, um, Amnesty International was saying that in a city in Guangdong, Puning, Puning 
uh, there were something at like 10,000 um, sterilizations uh, as a mass effort. Now, how many 10,000 people do you think willingly went up there, and how many? Uh, there had to be a percentage of people who were not willing. Right. So that's my answer also, to you. You mentioned women do not have inheritance. Uh, in the villages, typically the inheritance in the goes by the man. Yeah, and also, but in the country, uh, in the cities now, here's the thing, right? Um, private ownership of cities um, only started in the last what 10, 15 years before there was all you know communist assigned apart, uh, housing. Um, there was a study that done by a woman called Lita Hong Fincher. She's a sociologist. She wrote a book called Leftover Women. Found that almost seventy percent of all uh, city household registrations are in a man's name only. Even if the woman helps out, even the wife pays for the mortgage payments most of the time, the name is only in the man's name. So if they divorce, then it becomes he gets most of the asset. And, and certainly from an asset accumulation point of view, property ownership has been the biggest asset uh, wealth creator in China. So guess who's missing out? Women. I'm sorry, she asked first. <laughs> You started out with some you know, kind of big data demography about the big trend, and then you moved to stories, which were mostly about people, uh, uh, young adults and middle-aged adults, and they're today living with the long-term consequences. Uh, I have a friend who's a historical demographer, and he estimates that between three and four hundred, three and four million, four hundred million babies had, were, were not born over this 35-year period that would have been born otherwise. So the, the total population of China is much lower than uh, it would have been without. And then the question is, can you use big data to analyze some of the economic consequences of that shift, short-term, agreed, away from the burden of raising all of those young people that it affect labor market participation? Did it affect school size and classroom size? You know, uh, did it affect uh, the personal choices that young people who did were single children grew up had? Has anybody studied that okay. to see kind of what the big data consequences of this were for that generation? Okay, did so it help jumpstart the big growth that we've seen? So the 400 million we're talking about as actually a debate. The Chinese government has maintained for a long time that the one-child policy has reduced the number of uh, births by 400 million. 400 million, what does it mean? It means two Americas. That's very significant, obviously speaking. Uh, but that number has also been disputed. Uh, there were a, a group of uh, sociologists and demographers. Uh, one of them is, uh, I'm going to see him tomorrow in uh, UC Irvine, Wang Feng. And they've done their calculations, and they estimate that the number is actually closer to something like 200 million, half of that. Now, 200 million, still significant. Um, and the reason why they say that it was um, uh, overestimated was because it was based on a, uh, a population growth trajectories of uh, the 1960s. But uh, so they were saying, OK, if this is the way the shape looks like, then uh, this is how many births that would have been averted. But the problem with that kind of a projection was it did not take into account the kind of massive social changes that were happening in the intervening period that drastically shaped fertility, urbanization, uh, feminization, you know, women going to college and things. All these things shrunk. So you were, I mean, the analogy I sort of use is, 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 is as if, uh, uh, imagine, if you will, a tour company, that uh, a tour agency that tries to plot a, a tour group a itinerary, uh, assuming that people still travel by steamship uh, in today's age. You know, so it's it's uh, so. But jump just to yeah, just to give you a question. Even assuming, let's say it's 200 million versus 400 million, that's still significant. That's the population of Brazil. So what if? Um, what if the one-child policy had never been put in place? Would, you, would China have an excess? Would the world have an excess 200 million people? And what would this mean? Um, you know, and there are, there are certain arguments that say that basically um, China's population rate would have reduced anyway without the imposition of the one-child policy. Not many people outside of China know that uh, in the time between 1970 to 1980, 10 years before the one-child policy, they actually had a population planning policy in place. It was called the later, longer, and fewer policy. It was much less coercive. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there was some amount of coercion employed, but the whole idea was to encourage people to get married later, have fewer children, and space them longer apart. During that period of time, the average family size went from six kids to three. So that's pretty significant. And so some people argue, you know, you could have seen that population trajectory continue to happen without the imposition of the one-child policy. And certainly, if you look at all of China's neighbors in the surrounding areas, um, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, Thailand, Singapore, 
Hong Kong, all these places, they all grew to economically, uh, economically very significantly. A turbocharged economy reduced the population size without having anything as drastic as the one-child policy. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> we have to give some people opportunity to ask some other questions, but feel free to come and talk. Um, yeah? One, one of the arguments that I hear from um, Chinese women friends is that they credit the policy for their education. That they think more than anything else, this produced a dramatic change in equality for women in China. No question. I mean, I'm not saying the one-child policy was bad for everyone. I mean, for a certain subset group, um, for some groups, uh, it was good. Um, if you were a woman born after 1980 in a city in China, your chances of getting educated, better fed, better than any other time in history uh, because you have no siblings to contend with. Uh, many of you who are students from China who are here in this room are beneficiaries of the policy because guess what, if you had several siblings, do you think you'll be a, your parents would want to send you uh, to, to USC? The chances are they would have to stretch their resources a little bit more, right? So um, part of this boom that we see in American um, higher education from the Chinese students is because of the one-child policy. So yeah, uh, uh, sorry? Okay, so, yeah, so coming to that, which is the flip side of the our argument is, yes, for some women in China, one-child policy was a good thing, uh, but it would be very hard to argue that it was good for all women in China or elsewhere for that matter, because here's the thing, way for shortage in women, um, uh, there's been a rise in trafficking in um, Cambodia, Vietnam, all the neighboring countries, uh, sex trafficking. Uh, prostitution has been on the rise in China since the 1980s. It is very much a part of China's social fabric, even though it's illegal. There's been a rise in concubines, why, second wives, or I, you know. I would argue that, it, you know, um, you know, for, while it's been good for a lot of women, and I certainly know a lot of my Chinese friends who are very high and smart and, and really uh, high achieving, um, China is still a very patriarchal society. There's very few women at, at the top levels of business, certainly none at the political elite levels. Um, so um, I, it's hard to say that it, it's been, you know, that the lot is going to increase going ahead. I could talk more about this, but there's more in the book about that. Yeah, you. Uh, yes, I'm wondering about the uh, government's intentions on these policies. I mean, you mentioned the one-child policy that they did. Uh, any thoughts on this gentleman's questions about uh, enforcing the mail? Um, it sounded ambiguous as well, depending on where you lived or who was enforcing and so on. Um, and then you also mentioned lack of transparency. So what is the government's intention of the one child policy? And if it's, you know, applies to this village and not that village, you can have two there and three there. Well, there. that was more of a practical means to make it work. Um, I think there's a saying, uh, opening a, a, a small, uh, <coughs> A small hole to close a big gap, right? As the saying in China, you know, we have to allow these sort of small concessions to make the overall policies work. The intentions of the government were very clear. They were doing it uh, to uh, give better um, quality of living to existing people in China because obviously resources would be much better if it was fewer people. The other issue was a question of economic growth. Um, you know, they wanted to grow e economically and they felt that by reducing uh, the population, it would help jumpstart them. China at the time, you know, coming, was just coming out of the Cultural Revolution. It was very poor. Um, yeah, so that, those were the intentions. Yeah, and I just saw the slide of the real TV. That yeah. Was, uh, the national moral model and the transgender. I'm glad you recognized him. <laughs> yeah, because I talked to him for uh, like a year ago. So I wonder, how does the uh, one child policy affect the gender issue and the LGBT communities in China? Um, yeah, I. I feel like in some ways, I mean, China is opening up a lot. I mean, there's just recently a legal case uh, that uh, for the uh, first uh, gay couple uh, to try and get their marriage recognized in China. Uh, so, so it is. But on the other level, I feel like it's it's not really helped in a sense because, um, for example, if if a, a third of the population are, are only children, uh, it's been very difficult for some families. The, the pressures on the the one child to produce or, or keep within the certain system is 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 very, has intensified. But uh, barring that aside, um, from a government perspective, from a policy level, uh, it still institutionally recognizes families as husband and wife and child. So a lot of the other kind of family institutions that we see being formed by gay couples, uh, by single mothers, are, are not encouraged 
in China. And so, you know, many of these people who want to have children, for example, would have a very difficult time getting their children registered uh, because of that. So that's been going on for a while. And so these children become what we call the hey heizer, you know, non-entities uh, with no registration papers. They can't get to school or schooling without a lot of under the table payments. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the subject of uh, same-sex marriage and whether or not China would uh, permit it, uh, with this imbalance, you certainly have you know, the, those kinds of demands. There's a book by a historian from Stanford that looks at, not at the future of China, but at China's past. And in poor areas, polyandry, that is to say, one woman, several men, was not uncommon. And he argues that it was as common as polygamy, one man, several women, in China's past, in the poorer areas. There's, yeah. there's also an academic who's argued that with the women shortage that they should bring it back again, you know, that uh, that's a solution. Um, only I don't know very many modern women who would run a half more than one husband. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which book was it again? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you argue from a sheer economics point of view, which is interesting, is what does a shortage in women will result in? Will it be a better case for women or worse? Um, you know, uh, if you look at the law of economics and supply and demand, theoretically, women should have the upper hand. They can command the ruse. I'm going to argue, I think that, that because of the existing structure that this is, that it actually means a worse thing for women. I, I think I see a, a rise in a, what we call, the, as you say, objects, commodification of women. And one of the stories I write about is, um, let me find it here, is um, a factory that I visit in uh, southern China, in Dongguan. This is a factory that makes sex dolls for, um, this used to be, um, you know, of course, manufacturing in China has, um, you know, taken all sorts of uh, has uh, changes because um, the the cheap uh, labor uh, is no longer there anymore. Things have risen risen up a lot. China is no longer the manufacturing center. We're making cheap things like T-shirts or toys. That's all gone elsewhere. So in this particular case, this fa uh, company used to make office furniture. Uh, but uh, office furniture, you know, and the cost had risen up so much it was not economically feasible for them to do office furniture anymore. So they started thinking, well, what do we sort of manufacture that's a high value item that will be in high demand? And their answer was sex dolls, uh, because clearly, you know, there's going to be huge demand for this going down the long run. Uh, these were large you know, dolls, you know, we're not talking blow up dolls, but, you know, big <laughs> life size ones that they have to ship in coffin size uh, crates. Um, and you can customize them. You want this big, this big, uh, <laughs> uh, real hair, fake hair, you know, uh, all these things. So, um, the, the reason why Yusuf was not just to, to have laughs, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of a funny story, but it's also kind of a creepy, scary story for women. Um, and, um, you know, it's both a business story and it's a demand story, but it's also a, 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 a way of looking ahead. One of the things I see a resurgence of in China, which I talk about in a book, is the rise of what we call the Confucius workshops. And that's not the same thing as the Confucius Institute, which is a global arm of the Chinese government. This is, this is an internal set of workshops that sort of promote a sort of a, let's get back to traditional values. So what it does is uh, a lot of the speakers will talk about um, women, uh, don't be so strong. Uh, obey your husbands. Uh, strong women will get cancer. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, and, and it's 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 quite popular among uh, blue collar workers. You know, and it's sort of and you, and you think to yourself, this is insane. You know, China's come so far. Why are we jumping back? But for every advance, as we know, there's a backlash. Certainly here, feminism, there was a backlash against it, and I think we're seeing, we're going to see that in China coming up ahead. Yeah, um, I. Um, uh, how are we doing for time? Do we have to finish off now? Maybe. Uh, maybe uh, five more minutes. Okay, so let's allow room for one more question. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the numbers are, but a lot of Americans uh, adopted girls from China. About 60,000. 60, 60 to 70,000, yeah. 
that answer to that is very hard to come by. Like I said, I, I, I cannot claim to have any kind of a great estimate. Um, one of the people I profile in this book is this man called Brian Stye. Uh, he lives in Utah, that's his wife, and they have three adopted daughters from China. He runs a small outfit called Research China. They do a lot of research into uh, parents, adoptive parents who want to research the origins of their ch uh, adopted child in China. Uh, he maintains that the, that a significant amount of orphanages in China en engage in uh, baby selling and corruption of some degree. Um, uh, it's hard to, to corroborate all that, I, I, uh, and I talk about it in a great deal of the book because um, there are no other sources. Another woman I interview in it is this woman called Ina Hutt. She was the head of the World Children, uh, which is uh, the, the Netherlands' largest adoption agency. The, the Dutch adopted a significant amount of Chinese babies too. Uh, after a, a baby trafficking scandal in Hunan in 2005, she was very troubled by it and she tried to get the Dutch authorities and the Chinese authorities to investigate further. She got nowhere. She went to China on her own using her contacts to try and find out more. And she came away with the conviction that the trafficking, baby buying issue was much more widespread than she had been led to believe. And she could not continue her job in conscience. She resigned from her job. When I met her a year, two years ago, she had, she told me she had spent five years without a job because um, nobody likes a whistleblower. Mm. Um, she's just recently become head of a uh, human trafficking agency in the Netherlands. So that is a, a somewhat happy ending to the story. Now, how do uh, adoptive parents deal with this? Um, there are some, of course, who are concerned and want to search. And there's a whole new, uh, there's, I discuss some of it in the book. Some of them are using things like DNA uh, search technology, for example, to try and find parents. But I found for the most part that many adoptive parents were hostile to the idea of the, the, the beautiful narrative that the one-child policy basically made all these children unwanted uh, and they were doing a good thing. But when in truth, you know, there were many parents who did want their daughters and maybe weren't so willing to give them up. Some of them tried to hide them. They didn't register them, but they didn't intend to give them away forever either. Um, I, I, there, there's a quote I have in here from a woman who is uh, um, uh, an executive in the Midwest. Um, she's, a, she's a media executive, and I, I talked to her, I said, look, you, you handle media. You know some of these stories. Are, uh, you, you know it's not all this beautiful, sunny, daisy stories. How do you contend with it? You have two daughters from China. She said, you know, I thought about this. Um, at Christmas, a couple of years ago, my daughter was hanging up the um, Christmas decorations. And I thought, well, at least she's hanging the Christmas decorations. She is not making the Christmas decorations, because, which is what she would do if she was raised in China. She'd probably be working on a factory line. So I saw the point of her argument because um, I have seen both sides of the equation. There is no question a lot of these children are materially better off. But what are we trying to say, therefore? You know, are, we allowed, are the rich allowed to buy children or the poor not allowed to have them by the very virtue of their poverty? Mm -hmm. I mean, where do we draw the line? You know, this is the question. So thank you very much for coming, all of you.